All right, let's open our Bibles. We're in Romans chapter 8, and I'm going to talk about the removal of fear, and I'm just going to preach the first part of this message. The first two points that are there in your outline is what I'm going to preach this morning, and I'll complete it next week. But the removal of fear, look what he says here in Romans chapter 8 in verses 15 and following. It says, For you have not received a spirit of slavery leading to fear again, but you have received a spirit of adoption as sons by which we cry out, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are children of God, and if children, heirs also, heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ. If indeed we suffer with him, so that we may also be glorified with him. Well, listen, those are great statements, and we'll go through the rest of the chapter and the other, next message. But he says, we have not received a spirit of slavery leading to fear. Listen, we're in a world where there are a lot of people that are fearful. And some of this, some of these fears... People promote fears. I don't get this. I'm tired of hearing, well, you've got to be scared, just scared to death of everything and act like, well, climate change is going to destroy planet Earth. No, it isn't. God controls the world. Man does not. Our coronavirus is going to kill everybody. No, it's not. It's, we hate the disease, but still 99% of people get over that and get well. So, but people just want to pump fear constantly into us. And then some people, it's self-imposed. I mean, we just, we just fear everything. Is this person going to lie to me? Will I lose my job? Am I doing everything right? Can I handle this trouble that's coming my way? And we get so worried and so anxious and so fearful. Well, I'll tell you, that's not the Lord's intent for your life. And throughout the Scripture, He gives the message, be not afraid. So, what about the removal of fear? What is it that we need to know and need to remember if fear is going to be extracted from our lives as believers? Now, I'm talking to believers, followers of Jesus Christ. If I don't know Christ, uh, then yes, I have things I can definitely be afraid of. But if I'm a follower of Christ, fear is not to be a part of my life. So what will remove it? Well, I think these things, first of all, just to know what that first song that we sang this morning, what it says to us, we are children of God. Now, look at this statement that he gives here in the passage, verse 16 and verse 15. After he makes the statement, you've not received this spirit of slavery leading to fear, but you've received a spirit of adoption as sons by which we cry out, Abba, Father. The Spirit of God, the Holy Spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are children of God of God. We are children. It doesn't say maybe we will be children of God. It doesn't say we hope one day possibly we will be children of God. It says we are children of God. To the follower of Jesus Christ, that is true of your life, children of God. Now, some believers in such a state in their life, in such a place where they wonder, well, what benefit is it to me uh, to be a child of God. Well, I'm a child of God, but so what? I received a call this week from a gentleman that's in Arizona, and he was a member in this church in the past, but he and his wife, they're just going through some very difficult times at, at this moment, and they had rented, they had a lease on a place, and they rented it, but the, the man who owned the place sold it to another guy, and the other guys told him, you've got to get out. And uh, so they've got that challenge before them. And then I asked him, I said, well, what about uh, your car? Have you been able to go to some churches and ask? He said, well, I was in a wreck. The car was totaled. Well, we helped him. I mean, our church, I called Alex Aaron, and we've helped him. We're glad to do that. But, I mean, you get yourself in situations like that, and you just you think, what benefit is it to me to be a child of God? And all this is happening. All this is going on in my life. Well, listen, you may have challenges like that right now, but let me just say to you, there are plenty of benefits to being a child of God. A few years ago, this was several years ago, when Frank Keating was the governor of Oklahoma, I was over at the Y, and a guy over there told me, he came up to me. He said, guess who's here? I said, well, who? He said, Frank Keating's daughter. She's in there working out. Well, I had to go back there. I was going to work out back there, and he walked back there with me. He goes, there she is. And I, 
I just thought to myself, well, I mean, she's a pretty girl. I think she's in college, but I mean, she's just another person. And yet this guy, she's the governor's daughter. Wow. Well, you know, we all get like that at certain times. See, the child of some famous athlete or some famous movie star or some political power figure or some businessman that's exceedingly wealthy and their children, boy, what an advantage they have. Listen, you are a child of God. Those people have nothing that compares to what you have. You say, well, as a child of God, what are the benefits that are provided for me? Well, Ephesians chapter 1, verse 3, it makes this statement, we have been blessed with every spiritual blessing, every spiritual blessing. And what are those spiritual blessings? Let me just name some of them. Uh, these advantages, we have the indwelling of the Holy Spirit of God. God lives within us. No one else said, people outside of Christ, they don't have that. You have that advantage. The God of the universe, through his Spirit, lives in you. Look in 1 John chapter 4. 1 John chapter 4, and here's what it says. In verse 2 and following, he said, By this you know the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is from God. And every spirit that does not confess Jesus is not from God. This is the spirit of Antichrist, of which you have heard that it is coming, and now it is already in the world. And it is here, the spirit of Antichrist. One day I believe there will be an Antichrist, a one-world ruler, but the spirit of Antichrist is here. He says this, you are from God, verse 4. Little children, you're from God, and you have overcome them because greater is he who is in you than he who is in the world. Greater who is, is he who is in you. Paul wrote the believers at Colossae, Colossians chapter 1, verse 27, and he said, Christ in you is the hope of glory. So that's a benefit. That is a spiritual blessing we have. And then there's this. He clothes us with his righteousness. That's true for us as believers, all of us. 2 Corinthians 5.21 says, God made him who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we might be the righteousness of God in him. And when a person receives Jesus as Savior, that's when that takes place. It's not saying one day you'll be clothed in the righteousness of Christ. When you trust in Jesus, that occurs right then. It's called an imputed righteousness. God just puts our righteousness on us, and it's, it's marvelous. Don't, don't look at yourself. If you're disgusted with yourself in the mirror and think, I am, I am lousy, and God must look at me and think I am the scum of the earth. When he looks at you, he looks through the blood of Christ and sees one who is clothed in his righteousness. Tremendous advantage for a believer. And then there's this. We have the privilege of prayer. We can go to him in prayer. Jeremiah, this famous passage in the Old Testament, Jeremiah chapter 33, it says this in verse 3, Call to me, and I will answer you. And I will tell you great and mighty things which you do not know. But call to me. Talk to me. You can do that. Jesus said this in Matthew chapter 7. Christ made this comment. He said, ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and it shall be opened unto you. Everyone who asks receives and he who seeks finds. And to him who knocks it will be opened. Or what man is there among you who, when he asks for a loaf, will give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, he will not give him a snake, will he? If you then, being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father, who is in heaven, give what is good to those who ask him? Ask him. We have the privilege of prayer that we don't take advantage of it like we should. But that's a great blessing. And then there's this, his power. We sung about that this morning. The statement in Acts 1-8, when the Lord tells him you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. Well, that's not just power for witnessing. Listen, that is power for living, for living. Look over here in this text in Romans chapter 8. 
And uh, remember these verses. Here's what he said in verses 5 through 9. He says, For those who according to the flesh set their mind on things of the flesh, but those who according to the Spirit the things of the Spirit. The mindset on the flesh is death, but the mindset on the Spirit is life and peace. Because the mindset on the flesh is hostile toward God, for it does not subject itself to the law of God. It's not even able to do so. A person bound up in the flesh, lost, they can't set their mind on the things of God and live by those things. Those who are of the flesh cannot please God. But he says this, However, you are not of the flesh, but in the Spirit. If indeed the Spirit of God dwells in you, and if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, he does not belong to him. If Christ is in you, though the body is dead because of sin, yet the Spirit is alive because of righteousness. And he's saying right here, listen, you have this power of the Spirit of God to reside within you that will assist you in living. You don't have to be bound up in the flesh. You don't have to be caught up in carnality. You can be free from that. As he said in that passage we read a moment ago, you're not a spirit that's fearful, that is a slave, he says, to the carnal nature. You don't have to be. We're free from that. Power for living. And then power for serving. The Bible says in Ephesians 2.10, we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works. But he doesn't just tell us. Jesus never said, you just go out and do all the things I tell you to do. He, he told his disciples, when the Spirit of God comes, then you do this. And when you minister in the name of Christ, the Spirit's going to give you power. And here's, don't make this mistake. Don't determine whether the power of God is working through your life based on the response of the people that you're ministering to. See, we make that mistake. We'll witness to somebody, and they won't accept Christ, and they think, well, nothing good's coming through me. I mean, it's really the Spirit of God's not working. Well, that's not true. Or you go and you help someone, and yet instead of them yielding their lives to Christ, they just take what you've given and walk away. Well, don't think, well, that was just to no avail. It is not. Anything that you do, regardless of the response of the people that you're ministering to, whatever you do, there's a spiritual power that will go forth from you. We need to envision that in our lives. That's a benefit that we have. And then there's this. He has removed us from the kingdom of Satan and placed us in the kingdom of God. Look over here in Ephesians chapter 2. Ephesians in the second chapter. Paul says such great things here to the believers at Ephesus. And it makes me, when I see all that he's given them in these teachings to the Ephesian church, it stuns me that later on, as time goes by, Jesus has to say to this church, you've lost your love for me. You don't love me like you once loved me. It's not like they didn't have an advantage. They did. Tremendous teachings. But look what it says here in Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 1. It says this, and this is true of every one of us. It says, you were dead in your trespasses and in your sins, spiritually dead, separated from God, in which you formerly walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, of the spirit that is now working in the sons of disobedience. You were enslaved to this. Among them, too, we all formerly lived in the lust of our flesh, indulging the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, even as the rest. We were in that shape. But then it says this, God being rich in mercy because of his great love with which he has loved us, even when we were dead in our transgressions, he made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved. You've gone from the kingdom of darkness to the kingdom of light, to the kingdom of Christ. So listen, there's no believer that needs to walk around being, I'm so, gosh, that thing's in life for so bad, and I'm just afraid of all this that's happening. And I really want advantage that I have. Don't say that. You need to focus on who you are in Christ. You're a child of God and the benefits that are provided for you. 
not just in the good times of your life, but in the tough times of your life. And you focus on those things, and I promise you, it can give peace to your life. Sure, I may have a challenge, but I'm in the kingdom of God. Sure, I may make mistakes, but Christ has clothed me with his righteousness. I belong to him. It just removes fear. Whatever happens in the world, I belong to one who controls the future, and my life is in his keeping. But then there's something else. I want you to look at this. This should take away fear from us, and it's, it's this. We have an intimacy with the Father and immediate access to him, immediate access. Look at this statement up here. Come back over here to Romans chapter 8. And uh, look at the comment here in verse 15. It says, we've not received the spirit of slavery leading to fear again, but we've received the spirit of adoption as sons by which we cry out, Abba, Father. And that term Abba, that's an Aramaic term. It's a term of tenderness, a closeness, and a relationship. And since we have this kind of relationship with the Father, I can go, and you can as well, to our heavenly Father, knowing that he will love me, he's going to listen to me, he will help me, he will forgive me, he will always do what is best for me. My Father will always do that, and he will do that for you as well. And no believer needs to doubt that. We have this access to him. You know, when you think about uh, people that you have access to, I don't know that we have immediate access to anyone. You can say, well, I do my husband or wife. Well, not if you can't get them on the phone. You can't be with them all the time. And they may be out of town. They may be away from their phone. You may not have immediate access to them. And, you know, to people that you deal with, my doctor, my medical doctor, I've known him since he was seven years old. I baptized him. He's the first person I baptized in this church when I came here. Now he's my medical doctor. So I love him and am close to him. But I tell you what, I can't just show up at his office and go, hey, I want to see the doctor telling me to cancel everything and me walk right in. That won't happen. I can't even get past the desk. I have to have an appointment. If there's a lawyer, I don't have immediate access that I can just walk right in their office. How about a school teacher? Think I, can, I, I know school teachers in this church. You think I can just walk right in their classroom and say, stop the class, I want to talk. No, that's not going to happen. There, there are very few people we have, I don't know anyone that we have just immediate access to all the time except this one, and that's your Father in heaven. We have immediate, immediate access to him. Look over here for a second in the book of Esther. Turn to this, please. Esther in the Old Testament in chapter 4. Here's Esther. She's Jewish. She's married to a king who does not know that she's Jewish. Plans have been made by a wicked man named Haman to destroy the Jewish people because he hated them, and he didn't know the queen was Jewish. So he wanted all the Jews destroyed, and he had those plans all set up. Well, her cousin, Mordecai, who raised her, he gets word of this, and he's, he's traumatized of fear. And he tells Queen Esther. But he says this to her. He said, you need to go into the king, and you need to tell him about this situation. Now, you would think she would have gone, well, I'm his wife. Sure, I'll just walk right in. Well, that's not what these verses says. Look in verse 11 of Esther chapter 4. Esther says this, All the king's servants and the people of the king's provinces know that for any man or woman who comes to the king, to the inner court who is not summoned, he has but one law that he be put to death unless the king holds out to him the golden scepter so that he may live. And I have not been summoned to come to the king for these 30 days. And Esther related these words to Mordecai, and Mordecai told her. He said, you replied, Esther, in this way, do not imagine that in the king's palace you can escape any more than all the Jews. 
For if you remain silent at this time, relief and deliverance will arise for the Jews from another place, and you and your father's house will perish. And who knows whether you have attained royalty for such a time as this. And Esther sent message back to Mordecai, will you go assemble the Jews who are found in Susa and you fast for me? Do not eat or drink for three days, night or day. I'll take my maidens. We'll do the same. We'll fast in the same way. And then I'll go to the king. And if I perish, I perish. But look at that. She didn't even think that she could just go in there and speak to him and come out with a life. She was concerned, deeply concerned. You don't have to be that way with God. Think of that. You have immediate access to the God of heaven and earth. I don't care what time it is, midnight, 3 in the morning, 2 in the afternoon, it just doesn't matter. It doesn't matter where you are. It doesn't matter the condition that your life is in. You know, don't start thinking this. Well, look, I've, I've turned away from the Lord at times. I don't think. Uh, I don't think he'll be open to me. You can go to him. If you're his child, you can go to him any time. And you can tell him. You can pour out your heart. If the struggles, you should go. No wonder we're overwhelmed with fear with the struggles because we don't go to him. Or if we go to him, then we just take all the burden right back and don't trust him to work in our best interest. You go to him. You take that to him. I want you to look over here to Hebrews. Look what it says in Hebrews in the fourth chapter. Hebrews is such a great book, and it talks about Jesus being our high priest. And it says this, Therefore, since we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our confession. But then it says this, we don't have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who has been tempted in every way as we are, yet without sin. And you thought, well, Jesus can't relate to me because I've sinned. And maybe that's a hang-up with you because of my sin. I'm so ashamed of my sin, I can't dare go to the Father. Well, why would you ever say that? He beckons you to come to him. It says right here, Jesus has been tempted in every way as we are. No, he never sinned, but don't say he can't identify with you and can't sympathize with you. It says right here in the verse, he does sympathize with us. And then it says this, look in verse 16. Therefore, let us draw near with confidence to the throne of grace. It doesn't say you better come in there. Just slow and, and beg. It says, draw near to the, to the throne of grace with confidence so that you may receive mercy and find grace to help in your time of need. He says, come to me. He said, I understand what you're going through. I know about these temptations. I know how they can come at you at times like rapid gunfire. But he said, you come to me. Anything you've been tempted with, I've been tempted with. That's what Christ is saying. And don't say, well, that's Jesus, not the Father. They're one and the same. You go to him. Some of you may say this, well, look, I've, I've gone through this little routine so many times. I've, I'm sorry for sin. I commit a sin. I'm sickened by it. I confess the sin. I turn from it. And then time goes by, and I'm right back in the sin. And I've gone through that time after time after time. Some of you may be able to say that. And you think, he's going to get so put out with me running to him like that? A person told me the other day, she was telling me about her conversion, and she wasn't converted until she was an adult woman. But she said, every time we had a revival in our church, I was always rededicating my life. Every time. I mean, I'd go down here on a regular basis and rededicate. And then she said, as an adult lady, I realized I'd never met Christ. But even after she's met Christ, just like all of us, there are times when we sin and we confess it and we want to turn from it and we do for a period of time, then we get back in it and we get it in our minds. He's, uh, I've gone past point of no return. He's not, going to, he's not going to welcome me into his presence anymore. Well, that's just not true. What did Jesus say in Matthew chapter 18 and verse 21? 
Simon Peter comes to him and says, Lord, now if somebody sins against me, how many times should I forgive him? Up to seven times? And Peter thought he was being so magnanimous. <laughs> Lord, look at this. I'm willing to forgive them up to seven times. They sin against me once, I forgive them. Then they sin again, I'll forgive them. I'll do that up to seven times. What do you think of that? Because Jewish people said, no, you shouldn't. You shouldn't go that long. After three or four times, then you cut it off. Jesus said this, Peter, 70 times seven. What's he saying? You keep forgiving. You keep forgiving. Now, I'm just telling you, your Father in heaven is exactly like that. You don't need, I don't care if you've sinned a thousand times the same sin and you've asked for forgiveness and turned away and now you're back in it. You keep going to him. That's the only way ultimately that you can find victory. And it's the only way you can take away all these apprehensions and fears that you have in your life. What does it say in 1 John chapter 1, verse 9? It says, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And when does that happen? Immediately. It doesn't mean, well, you confess your sin to the Lord, and then maybe six months later the Lord will think about forgiving you. No, if you confess your sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness, and it happens immediately right then. Listen, you have that kind of access to God. So what in the world do I need to sit around as a believer living my life in fear? Well, I just fear this and fear that, and here are these challenges, and here's crises in the world. Listen, Watch TV. I've just practically had to quit watching the news because it doesn't make me fearful. It winds up making me mad, and I don't want to be that way. But, I mean, just this week I heard uh, North Korea has fired two missiles toward Japan. They landed in the ocean, but they fired two missiles. Then I've heard the president wanted to talk with the leader of China, and the China said no. And then I hear China's buildup. And then I hear all these troubles that are going on in the world. And listen, you just focus on that stuff, and you can be overwhelmed with fear. But I'll tell you this, if you do this, you start focusing on the fact, regardless of all this that's going on, I'm a child of the king. I'm a child of God. He is my father. Spiritual blessings are given to me. And any time, any day, I have immediate access to him. You dwell on that. I tell you, your heart can be filled with peace and calm, and fear can be taken away. Let's bow our heads in prayer. Lord Jesus, I thank you. We don't have to live all bound up, being afraid of everything that's going on. Lord, and I'm grateful. I hear all these people talk like they're controlling what happens in the world. Lord, they don't. They don't at all. You do. This is your world. And, Father, you're going to bring to the climactic end that you want. And, Lord, while we're here, Lord, we're grateful you're our Father. We're in your kingdom. We've been delivered from darkness into your kingdom of light. Lord, you work in our behalf. Lord, we can come to you anytime. Father, help us as believers to claim this and to live by it. And Lord Jesus, I just pray for any believer, whether they're in this room or whether they're watching by live stream, that maybe they're so anxious, so fearful in their lives, Lord Jesus, help them to come to you. And I thank you, you can make those fears subside and they can be relieved. And Lord, I just pray for anyone who's either watching today or maybe here in the service that they have never received you. There may be some people right in here, just like that lady I told about because she went to church all the time, rededicated her life all the time, but she'd never even accepted you. There may be people just like that right here. And Lord, if there are those who have not trusted in you, I pray that your spirit would touch them, work in their life, bring conviction. Lord Jesus, draw them to yourself. And Lord, I ask this in your name. While our heads are still bowed and our eyes are closed, we have this one final song. I would just say to those who are watching by live stream, if we can help you, we want to. Uh, there's a number there. There's a website. You can contact us. We'd love to assist you. If you need to receive Jesus, 
I'll tell you, you can do it right there where you are. If you're willing to just say, Lord Jesus, I'm so sorry for my sin. I want to turn from that. And I don't understand how you did all this, but I believe you died on the cross and arose from the grave. And I believe you can forgive me and give me eternal life. And so, Lord, I give my life to you. You pray a prayer like that right where you are. You mean that? The greatest thing in all the world can happen to you. And for any of you sitting here in this room, I'd say the exact same thing to you. If you're here in the room, there's a decision you need to make. As soon as Randy sings, I'll be right here at the front. If you need to receive Jesus or you want to talk about that, if you're a believer and you're looking for a church home, you want to place your life here, I'd encourage you to come forward. If you just have prayer needs, want somebody to pray for you, you come forward as well. You know, this message I brought today to me is so very important because most believers never share the gospel. If you're a follower of Jesus Christ, the only hope that people around you have of ever meeting Jesus if you will share the gospel with him, you and I are called by Christ to be his ambassador, his representative in the world. So I hope you will. I hope you'll share Jesus with your family, with your friends, uh, with people at work, at school. Tell people about the Lord Jesus. But then for all of us, the last part of that message about how we do have free will, and we do. We have a free will. We choose whether we're going to be faithful to Christ or not. Will I receive Jesus as my Savior or not? That's your choice and it's mine. I'm so glad to tell you I received Jesus when I was seven years of age. It's the greatest decision I've ever made. And I hope if you've not trusted in Christ that you take advantage of this greatest opportunity that will ever be offered to you, and that's for you to ask Jesus to be your Savior. Well, if we can help you, you just please let us know. You can contact us by phone or by the web page, and we'd be glad to assist you in any way that we can. God bless you. Thank you again for sharing in our services today.